So, uh, but God doesn't want you to have anxiety in your heart. Amen. Y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. And so we're going to work some things out uh, today. And so people are just uh, uh, funny. If you mind, I'll, I'm just going to get on my soapbox just a little bit this morning. If, if you don't mind uh, that we can go into Target and Walmart and Sam's. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And, and so, but one of the reasons that we're still open is for all the people who go to Target, Walmart, and Sam's right now. And you go to Brahms and you go to restaurants and you're like, you know what? I'm going to do the best that I can. I'm going to wear my mask and God's going to do the rest. Can I get an amen in here? Amen. amen. And so, uh, I don't want people to uh, have anxiety in their heart. God does not want you to have anxiety in your heart. This is not the time to hold your head down, but to hold your head up and know that God is on your side. And so he is still working things out for your good. He's still working things out for your benefit. Even though you can't see it right now, God is still at work. However, there is something that he's going to want us to do. Amen. And so there are some things that we have to do with regard to how we control our mind, how we control our thought patterns, what we begin to see and how we begin to hear things and how they begin to actually set up residence in our house, our fleshly house, that is, our spiritual house. Am I making sense to anybody this morning? And so this morning we're just simply going to talk about overcoming uh, anxiety. Say overcoming anxiety. Say overcoming anxiety. Because how many know God would not have you to be anxious over anything? And so for this week and probably the next week or so, we're going to delve into uh, anxiety. We're going to probably talk a little bit about mental health. We'll talk a little bit about depression, amen, about how, how God wants to reach in and pull you out of that. But there's still going to be a role that you have to play. Amen. And so everybody that's on medication may not need to be on medication. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. Amen. And so, but there's a fight that you're going to have to fight to maintain your sanity, especially in today's environment. Amen. And so the Bible says this in Luke chapter 10. If you have uh, your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 10. If you have your cell phone, I think they're going to be able to put it on the screen behind me. Amen. And so for those um, who don't have your phone, which I would think that you are uh, an anomaly this morning, if you came in, at least you don't have a phone. Amen. And so Luke chapter 10, the Bible says this in verse 38. It says, now it came to pass as they went that he had entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she should help me. And Jesus, verse 41, and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. If you guys don't mind, just bow your heads in a quick word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for even quickening our heart today. God, it's no more I, but the Christ that lives within me today. God, we thank you for the spirit of the preacher and the spirit of the teacher today. We thank you today for your word hitting the hearts and, of my, and minds of those who are here today, God, causing increase in their life today, O oh Lord. We thank you today that as the sower went forth to sow, that seed fell on good ground today, O oh Lord. We thank you for the harvest today, O oh God. We thank you that we just didn't come to church to shout and have a good time, but we came to learn more about you today, O oh God. We just thank you that when our backs are against the wall, that you would give us a ready word today, a word in due season today, O oh Lord. And we just thank you for it all in Jesus' name. And God's people say it. Amen. Amen. And so... You know, I, I just want to start because the Lord has just put some things in my heart. And so uh, how many know that if you live in this life, there will be stress? In fact, there will be stressors. And so uh, some of my mental health friends, they begin to talk to me about stressors of life. And there are things that as you go through life, there will be things that will want to attach themselves to you. And so there will be trigger points for you. And as you continue to grow and mature in Christ, you're going to have to recognize what your trigger points are because usually that's where anxiety is going to come in on. And so uh, there are a lot of stressors in life. And so uh, stressors are things actually that we care about. And so it wouldn't be a stress to you if you didn't care in some type of way about it. For example, we care about work, 
but work has a way of adding stress to our lives. And so many of us care about school, but school also has a way of adding stress to our lives. And so many of us have children that we love, but how many know that children have a way of adding, y'all don't want to talk to me in here. And so many of us love our family. You already know, you already know where I'm going with that. But, and our family has a way of adding stress to our lives. I woke up and the Lord started talking to me. He said, wouldn't it be great if we could somehow remove the stress from all of the relationships that we have? And so wouldn't it be great to go to work and to enjoy people and to enjoy school and not have any of the stress that comes along with maintaining those relationships? And sometimes stress comes and it begins to make us anxious. And so, uh, and that's kind of what we're going after today. And so I want to reach deep into your spirit and into your soul and begin to open up the heart of you and to say that, you know what, you do have some anxiety there or else you wouldn't be acting the way you act. See, stress is on the inside, but how many know it manifests itself through anxiety on the outside? And people handle and manage stress in all different kinds of ways. And so some people shut down, some people go off, some people uh, uh, hibernate. And so, and we were here last week talking about men. Men sometimes go into the man cave and never come out. But what I want you to understand is that stress is there, anxiety is there, but God wants to help you. Three months ago, when um, we first got the, the order from uh, our governor and our mayor and that we were sheltering at home, uh, and I remember just as plain as, as I'm here today, just as clearly as yesterday, Tarsha and I were at home. I had talked to her earlier about going to the grocery store. We had came home from church and we left church and went to go eat. We came home, uh, and as sometimes as our habit is, we took a nap. Right, And so uh, I woke up and I said, you know what, we need to go to the grocery store. We turned on the news and that's when the order came down, like we need to shelter in place. And so then I was even more motivated to go to the grocery store. And, and God knows who he puts you with. Is this making sense? Uh, and so your spouse is your spouse for a reason. And I'm believing that God put you there. But one thing I know for sure that God put my spouse with me. And so as much as I started getting agitated and irritated and like, we got to go, she said, you know what, those groceries are going to be there tomorrow. Do you really want to go today? And so I said, yeah, we need to go in today. And so she obliged me. And we went through the grocery store, and I was just putting everything in the basket. And as I put it in, she was putting it back out. And so she said, we don't even buy this. You don't even eat this. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And so, but, but see, sometimes stress begins to work, work its way out in all different kinds of, of ways. Is this making sense? As if we were going to run out of food. Is this making sense? See, stress comes, and stress, when it comes, it brings pressure, and it brings tension, and it begins to exert its pressure and its tension on your life. And so stress, I, I looked this up, stress is the state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. Say pressure. Say stress. See, God wants to alleviate that in you. As a Christian, think about this. Jesus gave his life so we would not be stressed out. And as much as I'm preaching to you guys, I'm preaching to me. And so God gave his life so that even your preacher won't be stressed out. So that the pastor's wife won't be stretched out. Uh, so, so that people who are in our music ministry and our singers and everyone who calls us their church home and Christians abroad won't be stressed out when we go through times like this. And so there is a lot going on in the world today. And so let me tell you kind of what's going on. So people have lost jobs. A according to the U.S. Labor Department, 45 million people have filed for unemployment since March of this year. So our country has had over 2.5 million confirmed cases of COVID, which has led to over 127,000 deaths. 
Almost 800,000 people have recovered, but that's enough to bring some stress in your life if you are not catching it. There are 60% of people who are going around today thinking, I might catch COVID. And you know what? And you wake up thinking about it and you go to bed thinking about it. And God is saying, I want to give you new thoughts. And so millions of people, millions of people are protesting all over the world for what we are deeming as social injustice and systemic racism that has been going on not for years, not for months, not for decades, but for centuries. And every time I turn on the news, my heart starts beating faster. As if I could do something watching from my television. And, once, and then I begin to realize once I turned off the news, that feeling is still in my chest. Say stress. <laughs> and so there are a lot of troubling things going on, and it has caused some to pause. Even Christians have, in some cases, backed up. Is this making sense? And so I just came to tell you that God is still God. He's still on the throne. And so although we're in troubling times, God is never troubled. And so although things may not look like he is in control, he is still in control. And, and here's the kicker, and this is what the Lord had put in my heart. So when you combine what's going on in the world and add it to what's going on in your world, then you end up having even more stress. Amen. You know why? Because the car payments are still due, the mortgages are still due, the utilities still need to be paid, insurance deductibles still need to be paid, hospital bills and school tuitions and daycare expenses and raising children. It still continues even though everything else is going on in the world. Can I get an amen in here? And so there are people who had to plan for a wedding in the midst of COVID, and unfortunately there are people who had to plan for a funeral in the middle of COVID, where you couldn't invite people that you wanted to invite. It had to be a family only. And so life keeps on going. But I'm wondering, how are you going on? And so life does what life does, but how are you doing life? We got quiet in here. I know. I know. We're, we're coming after something this morning because I want you happy when you leave here. Is that making sense? And so, because the bill's going to keep coming. Bills were coming pre-COVID, bills going to come post-COVID. That's just the way it is. And so, uh, and so, God wants you to begin to gird up your mind. Amen? And so, the Bible says this in Luke chapter 10, the Bible says this in verse 38. It says, now it came to pass as they went that he'd en he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. I like verse 38. It says, now as it came to pass, they went. So Jesus was with his disciples. They went into actually Bethany because that's where Martha's house was. We know Martha was there. We know that Mary was there because we're getting ready to read the story. And so Martha was the host. And how many know when you have people come into your house, it could be pressure. Yes, and and let, me, let me just up the ante a little bit. When someone comes to your house unexpectedly, it could be pressure. It could be a little stressful, De depending on the condition of your house. And so because remember, Jesus didn't send an email saying we're in the neighborhood, we're coming. He, he didn't call her on the cell phone saying, hey, girl, what you got to eat because me and the boys are coming by because we're kind of hungry. And so there was no, uh, uh, no advance warning. And so he just, he just, he just showed up because that's how they did things. Have you ever had people that just had the audacity Y'all don't want to talk to me. Just, to just show up at your house unannounced. And do you remember how you felt when that doorbell rang? And you peeked your head over the curtain outside to see if they could see you looking at them? Because you were making a decision whether or not to. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So, but think about Martha, because when her doorbell rang and she looked out there, it was Jesus. So even if she would have said, we're just going to sit here, Mary, and pretend like we're not here, this is Jesus. He's going to be like, I see you in there, girl. The, the Lord has given me a word. I know you in there. Is this making sense? So you can't hide from him. The only thing you can do is let him in. And how many know when Jesus begins to knock on the door of your heart, 
He wants you to let him in, although we think our house is too dirty to let him in, but he already knew how your house looked before he knocked on the door. Before he rang the doorbell, he knew how dirty it was in there. And so a lot of times we go through a lot of things trying to clean up something that is already dirty, and you, sometimes you clean up like kids clean up. Uh, y'all, y'all, if, if you had kids, you know what I'm talking about. If you ever had kids, because sometimes you have to go behind them and clean up the way you want it to be clean. And so, so they just showed up on Martha's porch unexpectedly. She invites them in, and then things start getting even more stressful. Because now she's got to clean the house. She's got to make food. She's got to prepare food. All of that just continues to heighten up the stress. So not only did she have enough with her day-to-day activities, but now she's got company. So it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. Remember, you still got your own world. And God doesn't want you anxious. Is this making sense? Let, 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 let me... Let me Leave Martha for a little bit. I want to talk to you. And how is your life going? How are things working out in your life right now? You anxious about stuff? Thinking about your job from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed? How many know this? That whatever will happen, will happen. And there ain't anything you can do about it except pray and trust God. See, see, right now, there should have been a burden that just should have released off of you. Is this making sense? And actually, just, I'm going to put a plug in for our financial pact. If you would have been coming from the, to the financial pact, you should have been having your, your finances in order so that you can kind of withstand some of the things that may or may not happen. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Say financial pact. One of the things that if I'm going to say it once, I'm going to say it a million times, that you need to get your money right. Because days are coming. Do do you know this, that everything that I read, they say our economy is not going to turn around for at least 18 months, maybe 24 months. There's a date that's approaching where uh, people who got money from the federal government had to keep employees on, right, because that's how they justified getting the money. But there's a date that's going to come that that they're going to say everything is squared away. And how many know there's going to be some people that might be laid off as a result of that? They kept them on long enough to get the money. But then once that day expired, they get rid of Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. Say stress. Say stress. See, I want to be able to pull that out of you. Amen. So Martha has dedicated herself to caring for Jesus. When you dedicate yourself for caring for Jesus and you get involved in that relationship as it relates to being a Christian, because how many know this? There will be stress that comes in your life even as a Christian. One of the things I love about Scripture, and some preachers don't preach the whole Bible, but I love preaching the whole Bible, is that the Bible says it rains on the just as well as the unjust. And the Bible says that the man who built his house on the rock was able to stand even though the scenario happened to both of them. And so what I want to give you today is something that's going to help you stand. Say stand. But one of the things that's very important to us is that we just don't come in and shout and have a good time but then you don't know anything about the Bible. You're not equipped to fight your own battle because everybody's going to have their own battle. Amen? Amen? Say pressure. Say tension. And so how do you handle when life comes at you full blast? A lot of us, we do well when things come at us one at a time. But when things come back to back to back to back to back to back to back, sometimes we begin to have pressure. Because, see, Martha did a good job in juggling her life. But then when Jesus comes, now you got to add another ball. Uh, And as more pressure comes, then you got to add two more balls. And then when more stress comes, you got to add two or three more balls. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And how many know it's only going to be a matter of time before you start dropping stuff. 
And, and then that's an experience all in itself. For all of us who think we have a, a super person, superman, supergirl complex, and now you start dropping things. How do you handle that? How do you handle not being perfect? I know you have this image where everybody thinks that you're perfect, but how do you handle when people begin to know the truth? They begin to know that Superman is really Clark Kent, and he wears glasses, and he's timid. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And, and so how do you begin to adjust and handle life? And so one of the things that I love about Scripture, the Bible says this, verse 38, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And the Bible says, verse 40, it says, But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she should help me. Say family. Because we, we talked about family just a, a minute ago. How many know that some of your biggest stressors? Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me. I'm smiling when I say it. You can smile, too. Behind that mask, you can still smile. Because some of your biggest stressors will be family. The relationships that will bring most stress in your life. Because you know what? A job, you can find another job. If it's school, you can quit school. If it's something else, you might be able to turn away and walk away. But when it's family, how do you leave? God saw fit to birth you into that family. That family is something that you didn't even have a choice. You were birthed into it. You were a son, you were a daughter, you were pawpaw, you were mama, and so you were born into it. And so notice this, in God's plan, his providential plan, he birthed you into that family, knowing that your parents weren't right and knowing you weren't right and knowing that he's going to give you time to work all that stuff out. One of the reasons I love coming to church and having a church family is that it gives us an opportunity, if, no, if for no other place, than to begin to work out the Christian skills that we read about in the Bible. Because there are a lot of people who say, you know what, I can be a Christian and I can stay at home, which is true. You can be saved, you can watch a, a television broadcast and be saved at home. But how many know in order to work out your salvation, you're going to have to be around people. And everybody's not going to get along with you. I was nice, let me tell the truth. You ain't going to get along with everybody. Amen. And so there are some things you're going to have to work out. And so one of the things that, that I love about verse 39, it says, And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Mary was experiencing Jesus in a different way than what Martha was. Jesus came into the house, and Mary instantly said, You know what? While he is here, he's the most important thing going on in my life. This morning, we're talking about overcoming anxiety. Overcoming anxiety is going to mean that you're going to have to get closer to Jesus. Notice this. Martha sees Jesus and continues to work. Mary sees Jesus and stops everything that she's doing and says, you know what? This is the most important time in my life right now because the master is here. If you think that you're going to be able to overcome anxiety and overcome stress by yourself based on what you have and the strength and ability that you have, you're going to miss it every single time. Back in 2006, I'm preaching something that I know. Back in 2006, I had one of the worst health crises I ever had in my life. And it wasn't a physical health crisis, it was a mental health crisis. My wife knew about it, my aunt knew about it, my parents knew some of it, but I didn't even tell them everything. And it was just a time that when I look back, I'm thinking, God, you are so good to me. I remember having anxiety so bad that I would have anxiety attacks. 
where my heart would be racing, and Tarsha can tell you. And so I couldn't go to sleep. I, there would be days that I would probably have five or six hours of sleep in three days. And so, because my sleep was intermittent, I felt like I was walking around drinking like 10 Mountain Dews. I can't, I can't describe it to you. I was just jacked up. My adrenaline was just, it just, and it would not stop. It would not come down. I, I, I couldn't. I went to my doctor. They prescribed sleeping pills for me. The sleeping pills did not work. So we went from half a milligram to a full milligram, and it did not work. So then I went back, and their only option for me was to keep increasing the dose. And I would go home, and I would cry, and I'm saying, God, I mean, if your word is true, then, then, then I need some help, and I need some deliverance here. Y'all, y'all don't, some people don't know what it is, but I know some people in here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That, that when you wake up, you go, so how many know that when you go to sleep, you might go to sleep, but some of us wasn't getting rest. You can go to sleep, but not get rest. And so I would go to bed at 1030 or 11. I would wake up at 12. I would go back to bed, wake up at 130. I would go back to bed, wake up at 430. And I went to work. I would go to work so tired. When I would get off work, I would almost fall asleep driving home. And I told the Lord, like, as soon as I get home, I'm going to sleep. And as soon as I got home, wide awake again. So, so now it's 10 o'clock. I'm wide awake. My spouse is sound asleep, and then she started helping me and said, hey, you know what? So we would work crossword puzzles in the bed till she fell asleep. I would work Sudoku puzzles because I was still up. When I would finally fall asleep, it would be time to go to work. There are some times at 10 o'clock at night I would tell Tarsha, like, I can't, I can't sleep. So, so the, I would go out and walk. I would go out and run. Is this making sense? Because, you, I mean, when, when you are jacked up like that and you can't go to bed, you, you got to do something. Because then my breathing was changing, my heart rate was changing, and, and it, was just, it was just miserable. Y'all don't want to talk to me. And then I had a thought from the Lord. The Bible says this, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds and casting down every imagination and bringing it into the captivity of Jesus Christ. So this is how I would go to sleep. I would go to sleep saying nothing more than, I know, Lord, you love me. Jesus, you love me. Jesus, you love me. I would repeat that over and over and over and over and over until I fell asleep. Does this seem crazy to people? And, and then I would start quoting scriptures, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because this is what the Bible says, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, everything that would want to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, against my knowledge of God. And so then I was in a war. I was in a battle. I was in a fight. Because now what God was quickening in my spirit is everything I knew about him based on what the enemy was trying to tell me was going to happen. So I would go to bed every night quoting scriptures. I went, to, went so far as to, got, to get uh, CDs of scriptures and I would have my headphones on at night and that's how I would fall asleep just so it would give my mind peace. Because there was something going in my ears that kept the enemy from talking in my ears. Is this making sense? When I said that you can lay down and go to sleep and still not get rest, because all those thoughts still keep coming. Is this making sense? And so the more I started giving more time to God and, and listening to scriptures and quoting scriptures and began to uh, remind myself of the knowledge that I had in God, a lot of those thoughts slowly started leaving. 
Is this making sense? To the point that I'm free. Give God praise for that. Amen. But I stand here today to talk to you about things that go on in your mind. And, and what, are you, what are you watching that you're bringing into your spirit? What are you listening to that's bringing things into your spirit? And then you wonder where all these thoughts are coming from. Is this making sense? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I want you to have freedom. I don't want you to be tormented. We talk about spiritual things in church, but how many know spiritual things begin to help you as you begin to battle mental things and emotional things? Everyone have Matthew chapter 6? The Bible says this in verse 24. Well, verse 25, we'll come back to verse 24 if we have time. The Bible says this, verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Did y'all catch that? If not, that's, 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 that's why I'm here because, you know, that's, that's why you got to preach it. Verse 25, it says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. How many know thoughts will come? Thoughts come into your mind every single day, every single second, every single minute of the day. Thoughts are coming. But this is what the Bible says, verse 25, don't take it. So therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Verse 26, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? So, so what Jesus is saying, and it's read in my Bible, what Jesus is saying is you don't have to take those thoughts about what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, because that's God's business. That's God's job. And, and notice this, verse 27, it says, which of you by taking a thought can add one cubit unto his statute? Verse 27, meaning if you think on it all day, it's not going to make you grow any taller. I just wish I was taller, but how many know, even though I think about being taller, it's not going, I can take that thought, but you know what? It won't begin to manifest because there's nothing that you can do when you just take thoughts and those thoughts are not deemed for your, for your growth. Verse 29, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? Verse 31, here it is again. Therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? And notice this, verse 31, when you take a thought, the first thing that happens is you say a thought. So if the enemy tells you, you ain't going to make it, and you take that thought and you begin to say, I don't know how I'm going to make it. When the enemy comes and says, you know what, that pain you felt in your abdomen, abdomen, abdomen must be cancer, then you're like, I think this pain in here is abdomen. It, I, I, is it just me or does the enemy play mind games like that with a lot of people? When you have a headache, he's telling you you got a brain tumor. And he's wanting you to give life because life is in the power of your tongue. So if he can give you a thought, then he wants you to take your life and give life to his thought, bringing stress then and anxiety into your life. You brought it in by what you think about and by what you say. That's why the scripture says, don't take those thoughts. But how many know this? For you not to take thoughts means that you're going to have to be in a battle 24-7 because thoughts come all the time. I look back now and I begin to just kind of just recount some of the thoughts that the enemy was, was telling me, you know, because 
my grandmother had breast cancer and my mother had breast cancer. And so then he was like, you know what? You might have breast cancer. So-and-so had this and you might have that. And that hand that's trembling, you know, it's going to never stop trembling and this, that, and the other. And so don't you know, that's a war. But you can overcome. But you're going to have to to get in the trenches and say, you know what? I'm not going to be moved. And then you begin to recount everything you know about God. That the Lord, he is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Though my enemies and foes came to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell, though a host should encamp around against me. And so you begin to talk about your knowledge. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. And so you begin to pull those thoughts down. No weapon that's formed against me shall be able to prosper. Every tongue that rises itself against me, I will condemn because I am the heritage of the servant of the Lord. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. Turn to your neighbor and say, what kind of knowledge you got? So, so, so that's why you just can't come to church and dance. Dancing is good, but at some point in time, it's going to be time for war. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And with his stripes, not will be, not going to be, I am healed. 1 Peter 2 and 24 says that he has healed us. The Bible says in the book of Philippians that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches In Christ Jesus. Is this making sense? The scripture also says, my God is a God who cannot lie. And he will not repent. If he told you something, it's going to come to pass. If he has to create a stream in the middle of a desert, he'll make it happen. If he has to create a door where there was no door, he knows how to cause it to happen. I wish somebody say amen in here. Because at some point in time, you're going to have to Begin to recount your knowledge. Because you can't fight a thought with a thought. You have to fight a thought by saying something. The enemy comes like, this is going to happen. And you're like, "Mm -mm, no, it ain't. Mm -mm." And then you're going back. No, no, no. You fight a thought with a word. You're like, the devil, you are a lie. I am the head. Not the tail. Above only. Not beneath. When I walk into the city, I'm blessed. When I go into the field, I'm blessed. Oh, yeah, you want to come and talk about kids? My children are blessed. The fruit of my womb is blessed. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. So, so the next time those thoughts come, don't take them. Don't take them. Because if you can keep the thought out, the battle's already won. Because once the thought comes in, then that means you're going to have to work something to kind of, because now we're in a battle. And that was the mistake I made. I let the thoughts come and they got into my spirit. Instead of automatically saying, you know what, that thought is from the enemy. My God loves me. Jesus gave his life for me. He gave his life so that I could be free, that I could be saved. The Bible says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that you might have life and you might have it abundantly until it overflows. See, you're going to be glad you came to church today because I'm trying to help guard you. Amen? Because this is the battle. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6 and I'll let you go. Ephesians chapter 6. You're like, what, the preacher went through all that? Yeah, the preacher went through all that, and I'm here to tell you that you can win. You can win. Amen. And you're like, well, I'm on medication right now. If God got you on medication, you need to take your medication. 
However you get your healing, I'm, I'm cool with it. I, I'm going to high five you, air five you, elbow bump you. However you get your healing, I'm, I'm with it. Is this making sense? Some of the best people that have ever been good to me in my life were my doctor. I love them. But there's some things that they can't do. That's why we go to the great physician. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says this, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. So you stand so you can withstand, and then having done all to stand, keep standing. Oh, I could go on there. I, I got some. But verse 14, and then it says again, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. When you go into war, and we're not going to get into the rest of this because I'm going to let you go. When you go into war, make sure you got your helmet on. And it's called the helmet of salvation. If you don't know anything else, you need to know that Jesus gave his life so that you could be free. That, that's what salvation is. That's sozo in the Greek, which means that there is nothing missing, nothing broken in your life. Sozo means that he's blessing you physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. The Bible talks about the woman who had the issue of blood, and the Scripture says that she was made whole, not just healed. She was made whole. God just doesn't want you healed. He doesn't want one aspect of your life healed. He wants you whole. The Bible says in 3 John, it says, above all, I would that you prosper and be in hell even as your soul prospers. And then you wonder why you're always in a battle. Because the enemy is after your soul. If he can get you thinking some different things, then he can get you doing some different things. Because you never do what you don't think. And if he can get you thinking differently, he can get you doing differently. But as a child of God, we have to tell him, you know what, buddy, you need to back up. God's, God is with me. And if God is on your side, you're the majority. The Scripture says, who can be against you? Nobody. Nobody can be against you. I stand here today to say, nobody can be against you. If God is on your side, nobody can stand up against you. Amen. We'll stand. Hey, we want to thank you for joining our broadcast today. Uh, we pray that the message has been a blessing to you. If you want to sow into our ministry, we have three options for you. Uh, the first is going to our website at www.impactcc.org. You can give online there, or you can also uh, text to give, and the number is 405-266-5020. And the last way, if you have a, a check or money order and you want to mail that to us, it's, you can mail that to uh, Impact Community Church at P.O. Box 121, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73101.